Okay, so let's start government construction contract under this particular chapter. We will learn the way government award contracts. You, you know what is the definition of the contract and the various processes embarked on awarding a contract and getting a contract from government. So um, let's read a brief introduction and I'll explain. Introduction. So the chapter discusses the procedures for awarding contract. This is actually chapter chapter four. So in case you have downloaded the soft copy or you have the co uh, copy of PISA, you can use it to guide yourself. So this is chapter four. So this chapter discusses the procedures for awarding contracts and making procurement in the public sector. It aligns the requirement of the Public Procurement Act 2007 and the implementation of the electronic payment system. So according to IPSAS 11, construction contract refers to the execution of a building and civil engineering projects, mechanical and electrical, installation and other fabrication evidenced by agreement between two or more parties. So what they are saying is that when you are talking of a construction contract, it has to do with constructing or executing a building. It must involve some kind of civil engineering work projects or mechanical engineering work. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, you can also con construct me mechanical machineries and the installation of electrical engineering works also. Construction contract is also fabrication. So anything that you will need to join two materials together to become a property plant or an equi equipment is under the construction contract. So let's talk about the tender boards. Now, as you can see, the tender is a proposal for the supply of some service or goods. It's usually made and presented as a result of an invitation. So before you can submit, submit a tender, a tender is just strictly a proposal. So when you go to a company or a contractor comes to your company, he wants to supply you goods or he wants to sell an item. For instance, he wants to supply computers. What you tell the contractor to do is to go and bring his proposal. <clears throat> that proposal will contain every information about the item he wants to supply and every information about the contractor itself. So that is all what the tender is. So as you can see, it says it's a proposal. So now we'll go to tender boards. You go to the tender board and types of tender boards. We have the departmental tender board and the federal tender boards. Now, we used to have the departmental tender boards and the federal tender boards have been abrogated. So what it means is that before we have, we used to have what is called the departmental tender board and the federal tender, but now they've been scrapped. So what has replaced them is called the permanent secretary and ministerial tender boards have now assumed their function. Now here under this tender board, contract of work or services and purchase of up to 5 million Naira can be approved by the permanent secretary. The permanent secretary is the accounting officer in charge of a ministry or 
chief executive without open competitive bidding. So what he's saying here is that without you requesting for people or contractors to submit their bid openly, you can select a minimum of three relevant contractors and say, hey, you guys submit your bid. They can, there might not be more than three of them. That is the requirement by law for them to submit a bid for an actual project. So what is a tender board? The tender board is strictly a group of government officials, individuals in government appointed to oversee the award of a contract. So there are more than one person. So they form a board, there's a chairman of the tender board, there's a secretary, there are other members that constitute a tender board. As you can see, I said, all the expenditure incurred under this policy should be documented and reported to the Honorable Minister on a quarterly basis for information. We also have the Ministerial Tender Board. <clears throat> the setup may be discussed as follows. The composition, the chairman is the permanent secretary of chief executive officer of the ministry, extra ministerial department, respectively. Other members are all directors, heads of departments, and in the ministry or establishment. Now, limit of expenditure, that's the limit of contract they can award is 5 million. The ministerial tender board is empowered to award any contract which its value exceed 5 million, but not more than 100 million. So here under the ministerial tender board, they can award a contract above 5 million, but not more than 100 million. But in the um, board of parastatus, they can only, that's permanent secretary and ministerial tender board, can only award contracts of not more than 5 million. But under the ministerial tender board, they can award contracts from 5 million to 100 million. The approval must be submitted to the Honorable Minister and he shall confirm the decision of the ministerial tender board. So we also have the Armed Forces Ministry of Defense tender board. These are also ministerial tender boards. Now, if you look at it, it says the, the chairman of the Armed Forces Minister of Defense Tender Board shall be the permanent secretary, Minister of Defense, with all other representatives in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Director of Finance, Account of the Minister of Defense. And the approval, the decision of the Armed Forces Minister of Defense Tender Board shall be subject to the confirmation of the Minister of Defense. So these are also ministerial tender boards. The minister has the final say here. We have the police tender board and purchasing board, which is also ministerial. And if you look at the approval, you see that each contract awarded by the police, Nigerian police tender board, purchasing board, shall be subject to the confirmation of the minister of police affairs. So just look at their composition also. So let's go to the power of board of corporation, parastatus, and tenders. So when we talk of board of corporation, parastatus, we have some government agencies that are not ministries. For instance, a parastata can be like Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, or Nigerian Communication Commission. These are parastatus or corporation, or when you talk of corporation, that's NMPC, Nigerian National uh, Petroleum Corporation. These are all 
parasitas or a corporation. They are not ministerial, but they have their own law guiding their procurement process also. So they say the chief executive of a parasita is empowered to make purchase or award a contract, the value of which does not exceed two million. 2 million 500 naira only <clears throat> excuse me without open competitive tendering however at least three relevant written quotation to be obtained from suitable qualified contractors or suppliers so any contract exceeding 2 million 500 but no more than 50 million shall be referred to the parastata tender board for approval. So 2,500,000 and no more than 50 million. Then if you look at C, say any contract whose value exceeds 50 million, but no more than 100 million shall be referred to the ministerial tender board of the relevant supervisory ministry corporation of parastata. So let's go to the Federal Executive Council. Federal Executive Council is mainly the president and all ministers, and the vice president, and the head of service, and the um, head of government of the federation. All of them all constitute the Federal Executive, Executive Council. And they can award contracts of over 100 million naira. That is their job. Now, tender splitting. Government financial regulation re regards it as an offense for any public officer to deliberately split tenders, contract of work, purchases, procurement, or services so as to circumvent the provisions of this chapter and the circular earlier referred to. Such breach of this rule will be severely dealt with with a competent, competent disciplinary authority. Tender splitting simply means that, for instance, you want to award a contract of, let's say, 20 million. And instead of awarding that contract to an individual, you now split splitted the contract into maybe five five million in four places that's tender splitting and is a criminal offense or you have a contract of 50 million but you know that you don't have the right or the capacity to award a contract above 20 million you now deliberately split that particular contract into sections and you are now awarding 20, 20, 10. That is a criminal offense. So registration of contractors. All eligible contractors, suppliers must be duly registered with the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing or their respective ministry. Remember, it's not just Federal Ministry of Works and Housing, any ministry. As long as you want to be a contractor, you must register with any ministry or extra parasitical departments, and you must have your VAT registration certificate. So <clears throat> that's just the minimum quality. But in, re in reality, you have your VAT, you have your CAC, that's the Corporate Affairs Commission, that's certificate of a corporation, uh, some Agencies we ask for your last three years for, uh, audited accounts. Some agency will ask for the profiles of your director's uh, work experience and any other thing that will be useful for them before they can be assured of giving you a contract. Audit inspection. The following must be forwarded to the Auditor General of the Federation. Certified through copies of all 
contract agreement. One. Two, the minutes of tender board meeting. Three, full records of all tendering processes, which shall be made available to the inspect for inspection of Auditor General for the Federation and the Accountant General as short or no notice. The record shall be kept for verification for a period of seven years from the date of completion and takeover of the project. Operation of tender boards. So, when approving, when approval has been obtained in respect of a contract for the supply of goods and services and available availability of form confirmed, the tender board secretariat will be informed of the magnitude of the amount so required. The secretary to the relevant board will inform the chairman as to when the contract will be slated for consideration. Where the board meet periodically, the secretary will present the issue as such a meeting. However, where the contract award necessitates any urgent, urgent any urgency, an emergency meeting may be summoned. Notice of invitation. At this meeting, the board orders a notice of information to tenders for the contract to be put up. Such notice will include all necessary details in respect of the job or services to be awarded. So there has to be a notice of invitation. Most times, this notice of invitation will be pasted on the notice board of that agency or ministry. Most times, they will advertise it on national dailies. And most times also, they can publish it in the government itself. So these are criteria for allowing contractors to come and submit bids or tenders. There have to be a notice. The second step is deposit for tenders. In some agencies or parastatals, they collect deposits. Some of them might sell form or use it as a registration for the contractors who are bidding. It's just a way of um, addi getting additional revenue from the public through that agency. So deposit for tenders also might be required before you can apply for any contract. They say where deposit is required before a tender form is submitted, it may be required that a treasury receipt for the required amount is attached to it before the form is considered at all. So <clears throat> as you are submitting your tender, you might be required to attach a photocopy of your receipt on the tender. Now let's talk about the tender procedures. Tenders are usually submitted in sealed envelope to the secretariat of the tender board. At the close of notice of invitation to tender, the secretary under the close supervision of the chairman or any member deputizing for him will open the tenders. They will be numbered serially and authenticated by the initials of the secretary with the dates indicated. The tenders will thus be listed in duplicates and kept in safe custody. A meeting of the board would then be summoned, among other things, discuss the tenders and make necessary selection for onward transmission to the approving authority. The board usually select the best of the tenders. So all what this is saying is that after all contractors have submitted their bids, their tenders, the secretariat will now itemize each of those tenders. Now, 
each of those tenders must be submitted in a sealed envelope so that nobody will know the context in them. There are even some tenders that you don't need to write the name of your company on the envelope. Just submit it in a sealed envelope so that there won't be any favoritism. So it is like that also. So you say, if a tender is rejected, fresh application shall be called for. However, if one of the tender is recommended, all the bills shall be forwarded with a duplicate list to the approving authorities with comment or remark on each tender to recommend or not. A word of contract. So this is after the old screening, all the submission and everything, now comes the award of the contract. The approving authority. So after the tender board, that's the secretary of the tender board. There's also the people who are responsible for approving the tender or the contract. The approving authority will communicate its position to the tender board. The secretary will subsequently write a letter of award to the successful tenderer and on inviting him for the signing of the contract, where necessary, a bond will have to be signed or shorty provided so that the person will not run away with the contract funds or what have we. When necessary, so in principle, the award of the contract has to be published in the newspaper, he said, and on successful tenderers, on successful tenderer informed as such. As earlier stated, such high true copies of the contract are to be forwarded to the Auditor General as well as the Accountant General. These are all control measures which government has placed in place, put in place just to monitor the way public funds are being spent or distributed. So it shall be emphasized that government contracts are not to be sublet as signed except the term of the agreement requires it required or permits this. So let's go to post contract award. Post contract that this briefly discussed the tender board information on voucher. So a voucher itself, when you hear the word voucher in any organization, it is a control measure put in place by an organization before revenue of funds, money is released from that organization. It's a control measure in the sense that in a voucher, there are checks and balances placed on the voucher. What I mean is that when you see a voucher, there are people who will sign on that voucher approving the release of that particular amount, depending on the organization or the individual or the size of the entity. Of the entity. So payment voucher in respect of a contract awarded through tender must contain among other things. One, certified true copy of the minutes of the meeting of the tender board in relation to the award of the contract, certified true copy of the contract agreements, copy of the approving authority, copy of each voucher in respect of payment already made on the contract. <clears throat> contract board information availability. So this is minutes of the tender board meeting and full records in respect of the various type of tender shall be made available. So you can read that one through. So let's go to terms of contracts. There are contingency clauses, retention fees, 
contract payment vouchers. Let know. So let's go to the contingency clauses. Now, this is one of the clauses in contract agreement, which states that if the contractor are taking reasonable care in executing the job and he is still faced with unexpected situation, which is not his fault, really. The contractee, that's the agency or government or the person awarding the contract or the owner of the project shall bail out the contractor by making money more, by making more money available or review upwards the contract sum or otherwise. The contractor will bear or, the, or otherwise the contractor will bear the cost. What it means by otherwise is that any reasonable contractor organization seeking contract must always put a contingency clause. What a contingency clause means is that just in case the opposite or the negative act happens, in most situations in an economy like ours that the economy is not stable, a simple example is if the dollar rises, probably when you got the contract in January, the dollar was still like 400 naira or 500. Now it's not up, it's not yet up to April. The dollar has shot up to 750. So that 250 naira loss shouldn't be paid by the contractor. And the contractee shouldn't say it's none of his business. But an intelligent contractor must have placed some clauses that are, ah, in case in this situation, the price of cement goes up beyond the price we have stated in our contract, the contractee, which is the government agency, will augment us. Or this and this happens. So he you put those clauses just to safeguard your own safety. Now let's go to retention clauses. It is a clause in the contract which states that after the completion of the project, government shall withhold 5% of the contract sum for six months. Usually we have some projects that might not be done properly. And if you have paid the whole money completely, completely to the contractor, it might form an issue. So usually if it's a construction contract or an installation contract, the government will want to make sure that the item will last for the, within the next six months before balancing the contractor with the remaining 5% of their balance. Now let's talk of contract payment voucher. As I've told you, a payment voucher or a voucher is a controlled the document showing the control measures by government before any funds can be released. So you just don't release funds after a contractor has issued you an invoice, you just release funds. No, a voucher has to back that payment. So that voucher contains some control measures. Those who will sign maybe board members who will approve the payments, checks and balances. After all those procedures have been followed, then funds can be released. As you can see, say all payment vouchers relating to a contract award should contain the following information. The name and address of the contractor, contract number, just to know which contract is being awarded. The vote of charge, when you hear vote, it means the amount charge. Description of the project, what kind of project is it described? Certificate number being paid. The gross amount and retention fee, if any, of the contract. The authority for payment, those are the signatories. If it is a part payment of a certificate, which is being effected, a statement to show the full amount of the contract and the balance outstanding should be disclosed. Payment for contract and procurement. 
the federal government policy from January 2009 is that public funds would enforce, enforce, enforce be made electronically. Payments are henceforth to be effected to the contractor by electronic transfer to their banks. The objective of the new system is to eliminate delay in payments, effecting payments to the con creditors, contractors, etc. So what they are saying is that checks are not really awarded anymore. Now government does its thing by transfer. So <clears throat> the implementation of the e-payments procedures, you can read that one, is similar to what I've just said. All bank accounts in respect of all government functions cease to be check accounts. So you can just read that from your own. So let's move on. Attachment to contract payment vouchers. So as I said earlier on, there are some documents you attach to a payment voucher. This document is just to show evidence that everything is clear and is authentic. So before a payment contract payment voucher is processed for payment, the following items should be ascertained and attached. A copy of the minutes of the tender board awarding the contract. It should be ascertained that the amount of the contract is within the board's power, as you can see. The, the completion certificate of work done signed by the competent authority in the field, such as an engineer, surveyor, or an architect, a copy each of the letter of award and contract agreement. In case of supplies, original copies of delivery notes and store receipt vouchers, a bill or invoice submitted by the firm requesting for payment. Now let's go to the contract register. Contract register is simply a register where the names and identity of a contractor is being recorded. So, and every other details is also there, just like the um, payment voucher register, where payment details of the contractor is being registered. Here, we have the information of the contractor being registered in the contract register. So, copies of all contract agreement must be forwarded to the account division of the relevant ministry or extra ministerial department. They should be entered in a contract registered that is maintained. The register will contain the following information. Contract number, contract sum, contingency and variation clauses, if any. Payment terms, terms of payment. Completion period of contract work file number, particulars of payment and balance outstanding, signature of the officer controlling expenditure. You can read them all up. So operation of the Public Procurement Act 2007. So in 2007, a commission was set up. It's called the or a law was enacted, which is called the Public Procurement Act of 2007. And this act brought about the National Council on Public Procurement. This is a council that is constituted by, or constitutes the Minister of Finance, who is the chairman. You have the Attorney General and Minister of Justice of the Federation, Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Head of Service of the Federation, Economic Advisor to the President, six part-time members representing, you can read them all. So after th these people, we have the objectives of the Bureau of Public Procurement. Now, 
We also have what is called the Bureau of Public Procurement. The Public Procurement Act 2007 establishes the Bureau. Its objective includes, so what the Bureau of Public Procurement, which is called the BPP, a harmonizing of existing government policies and practices on public procurement and ensuring probity, accountability, transparency in the procurement process. So it's harmonized. When you talk of harmonized, you bring all existing government policies together from different government parastatas. Then you check for their consistency in transparency, accountability, and you ensure probity. B, ensure establishment of pricing standard and benchmark. So every government contract, there must be a pricing standard. Not that you have over inflation. Then we have attainment of transparency, competitiveness, cost effectiveness, professionalism in the public, in the procurement system. So function of the Bureau, the Bureau function as stated by the Act include, I'll just read a few, formulating the general policy and guidelines relating to public sector procurement for the approval of NCPP. Let me go to F, publishing the details of major contracts in the procurement journal. Let me go to J, J, undertaking procurement research and survey. Let me go to O, reviewing the procurement and award of contract procedures of every entity to which the act applies. So let me go to S, coordinating relevant training programs to build institutional capacity. So now, I want to now know the role of accounting officer. If you remember earlier, I said an accounting officer is the head of a ministry or a department or a parastata of a government. They are the chief executives. They oversee in the private sector. You can call them the managing director, MD CEO or the general manager. Those are the account officers. So the account officer of every procuring entity shall have overall responsibility for the planning of organization of tender, evaluation of tender, and execution of all procurement in a, part, in a particular, and in particular shall be responsible for ensuring compliance with the provision of this act by its entity and liable in person for the breach or contravention of this act or any regulation made here, made here under whether or not the actor's omission was carried out by him personally or any of his subordinates and it shall not be material that he had delegated any function, duty, or power to any persons or group. So you can read those ones up. Fundamental principle of public procurement. What are the fundamental principles? Let us read just a few. Fundamental principles. A, subject to prior review of threshold set by the Bureau. C, by open competitive bidding. E, with the aim of achieving value for money and fitness purpose. And lastly, in accordance with procedures laid down in this act, and as may be specified by the Bureau from time to time. So you can read the remaining ones up and form your notes. Procurement method, we have for the goods and services. When we talk of procurement method, these are the various kinds 
or types of procurement an entity embarks on. So all procurement of goods and works by all procuring entity shall be by open competitive bidding. Open competitive bidding is a process by which a procuring entity effects public procurement by offering to every interested bidder equal and simultaneous information and opportunity to offer the goods and works needed. All what it means is that they are giving everybody the opportunity and equal opportunity for them to bid. There's no favoritism. So national competitive bidding. Now, the invitation for bid must be advertised on the notice board for procuring entity. Those are the criteria for national competitive bidding. International competitive bidding, you advertise the project on both national and international medias and on some prominent international websites. So you read all this bid opening, examination of bid. The bid shall be examined to determine whether the one meets the minimum eligibility requirement stipulated in the bid bidding document. I've, I've been, number two, I've been duly signed. Number three, are uh, substantially responsible for the bidding document. Number four, are uh, generally in order. So that's A part. B, you read the B and the C part. The procuring entity may correct purely arithmetical errors that are discovered during the examination of tenders, but must notify the supplier or contractor that submitted that submitted the tender about the correction. The following are major deviation which may result in the rejection of bids and return to such bidder. A, the bidder is ineligible or not pre-qualified or uninvited. B, the bid documents are not signed. So you, you can read others also. So, Let's go to evaluation of bids. The objective of bid evaluation is to determine the and select the lowest evaluated responsive bid from bidders that have responded to the bid solicitation. So let me just take one. Let me read. Let's see. Let me read C. All relevant factor calculated all relevant factors calculated in monetary terms in addition to price that will be considered for the purpose of bid evaluation and the manner in which such factors will be applied shall be stipulated in the solicitation document. So you read the service of international agents also. Bid security subject to the monetary or prior review threshold as may be from the time to time set by the bureau or procurement valued in excess of the sum prescribed by the bureau shall require the bid security in the amount no more than 2% of the bid price by way of a bank guarantee issued by a reputable bank accepted to the procuring agent. So a reputable bank, that's a, a good commercial bank. Not that if you go and bring a bank guarantee from a microfinance bank, it will be rejected. Performance bond guarantee, read them. Performance bond guarantee in an amount not less than 10% of the contract value or an amount equivalent to the mobilization fee requested by the supplier or contractor, whichever is higher should be obtained for all contracts. Acceptance of bid, domestic preference, mobilization fee. Let's, let me highlight the mobilization fee. Mobilization fee 
where necessary and appropriate shall not exceed 15% of the contract sum. What does it mean? Once the contract is given to a contractor, the first amount government will give you is your mobilization fee. Government expect that the contractor is capable and competent of handling such a project. So once they give you 15% of the job, of the contract, they expect you to use your money to execute the contract to a reasonable extent before they can even consider giving you extra money or not even giving you money at all. You go and use your money to finish the project, then they'll pay your balance. Interest on delay on payment, you can read that one out. That's also interesting. Due process guideline on government contracts. The doctrine of due process is an assurance that there is compliance with the budgetary procurement and payment guidelines by all parties to government contracts. The process ensures that competitive bidding has been conducted in line with procurement and contract award procedures. The best evaluated bid is selected among the pre-qualified bidders. The cost is conformity with comparable best values. So we have the revised guideline and threshold on public procurement. A, procurement approval threshold for Bureau of Public Procurement Tender Boards and Accounting Officers for all ministry and departments and agency. You can go, to, go through those ones, it's important. We have a table, procurement approval threshold. These are because each ministry and department are really bigger than each other. You cannot compare, for instance, NMPC, which is a parastata, and compare it with NTA, Nigerian Television Authority. So there has to be a threshold based on the size of the organization involved. So don't say because NMPC probably on their own can award a contract above 100 million. NTA should also award the contract above 100 million. No, they are not the same category or size. So we have the revised special financial limits and threshold, procurement method and threshold of application and for expenditure related to the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation procurement method or threshold for application. So let's continue. Procurement plan. A procuring entity shall plan its procurement by preparing the needs assessment and evaluation. B, identifying the goods, works, or service required. C, carrying appropriate market and statistical survey and on that basis, prepare an analysis of the cost implication of the proposed procurement. D, aggregating its requirement whenever possible, both within the procuring entity and between procuring entities to obtain economy of scale and reduce procurement costs. Those are part of the procurement plan that a contractor must prepare. Procurement implementation. So these are the implementation of the various procurements. A procuring entity shall in, shall in implementing its procurement plan, A, advertise and solicit for bids in adherence to these acts and guidelines as may be issued by the Bureau from time to time. So, Kindly read and form your notes on this one. Special and restricted method of procurement. Two-stage tendering. <clears throat> what is a two-stage tendering? An entity shall engage in procurement by two-stage tendering in the following condition. One, where it is not feasible for the procuring entity to formulate details detailed specification for the goods or work, or in the case of services, to identify their characteristics and where it seeks 
extenders, proposals or offers on various means of meeting his needs in order to obtain the most satisfactory solution to his procurement need. Two, where the character of the goods or works are subject to rapid technological advances. So you read and list maybe like three or five items to form your notes also. In the second stage of the two tender proceedings and procuring entities, you read that one also. Restricted tendering. Now, subject to the approval of the bureau, a procuring entity may for reasons of economy and efficiency engage in procurement by means of restricting tendering in the following conditions. Thus, you can decide not to do an open competitive bidding and restrict the numbers of contractors you want to you want them to bid. A goods or works or services are available only for a limited number of suppliers or contractors. Time and cost required to examine and evaluate a large number of tender is disproportionate to the value of the goods, works, or service to be procured. So that is just it. You list other items that you find in the list. Direct procurement, this one is strictly that the entity can decide to, like on their own, call contractors to come and bid. These are called direct procurement. You can read that one on your own also. Let's go. Emergency procurement. In a situation of, for instance, during COVID, the government didn't have time for bidding processes because the whole world was in uh, calamity. So there was, so the, the, the procurement will be based on whosoever is available supply. So an entity may carry out an emergency procurement on the following conditions. Where the country is either seriously threatened by or actually confronted with a disaster, catastrophe, war, insurgent, or act of God nature. You can also read that one. If so, that you have an idea, a more broader idea. Disposal of public property. During the disposal of public property, the entity should comply with the following step. The open competitive bidding shall be the primary source of receiving offers for the purchase of any public property offered for sale. The Bureau shall, with approval of the Council, determine the applicable policies and practices in relation to the disposal of all public practice properties definition of public property public property is defined as resources in the form of tangible and non-tangible assets number one created through public expenditure acquired as a gift through deeds acquired in respect of intellectual and proprietary acts or rights acquired by good will and any other gifts of the federal government. This means of the means of the disposal of public assets shall include sales and rentals, lease and higher purchase, license and tenancy, franchising and auction. Other offer to the public at an authorized variation offenses any natural person not being a public officer who contravenes any provisions of this act commits an offense and is liable on conviction to a term of imprisonment not less than five calendar years or not exceeding 10 calendar years without option of fine so you can go through all these ones also Read the offenses under it. <clears throat> so, 
accounting for construction contracts. IPSAS 11. Construction contract is a contract or a similar binding arrangement specifically negotiated for the construction of an asset or combination of assets that are closely interrelated or interdependent in terms of their design, technology, function, or their ultimate purpose or use. Examples of construction contracts include, but not limited to the construction of refineries, airport dams, railway tracks, road, bridges, pipeline, tunnels. Contractor is an entity that performs construction work pursuant, pursuant to a construction contract. Cost plus or cost based contracts. So now let's understand what is cost plus. Is a construction contract in which the contractor is reimbursed for allowable or otherwise divine cost. And in the case of commercially based contract, an additional percentage of this cost or a fixed fee, if any. Fixed price contract is a contract, is a construction contract in which the contractor agrees to a fixed contract price or a fixed rate per unit of output, which in some cases is subject to cost escalation clauses. Unit price contracts are based on anticipated quantities of items which are counted in the project in addition to their unit prices. The final price of the project depends upon the quantity required to carry out the work. Let's go to time and material contract. Are usually preferred if the project scope is not clear or has not been defined. The owner of the contractor, the owner and the contractor must establish an agreed hourly or daily rate, including additional expenses that could arise in the construction process. The cost must be classified as direct, indirect, markup, and overhead. Sometimes the owner might want to establish a cap or specific project duration to the contract or that must be met in order to have the owner's risk minimized. Retention are uh, amount of progress billing that are not paid until the satisfaction of conditions specified in the contract for the payment of such amount or until defects have been rectified. Progress billing. You can read the trade receivables, amount due for customers, read them and form your notes. Contract revenue. According to the standard, contract revenue should comprise the initial amount of revenue agreed in the contract one. Variation of contract work claims incentive payment to the extent that it is probable that they will result in revenue. Two, they are capable of being reliably measured. Contract costs. Contract costs should comprise costs that relate directly to the specific contracts. I will say more than that. Recognition of contract revenue and expenses. So read it. If you have done, if you are doing FR, financial reporting, most of these standards are also in your notes. Recognition of expected deficits. Disclosures you can go through all these ones. Accounting treatments. Can they go through all these ones? We have an illustration here. 
but we can't do it right now. So go to inventories. So without much ado, I'd like to stop here. But go through the chapter four of your notes and um, read them and form your notes. Let me see the efficiency of pension reform act. Okay, this is chapter six. So from here, we'll continue some other time. Thanks.